in this podcast video, you will have not just one host, but three. Let's see if you can handle three podcast hosts in one episode. Hi, I'm Alexandra Zhurev and I'm here to help you do better digital pathology. So if you want to be a digital pathology trailblazer this year, this channel is for you. So go ahead, click the bell below, uh, subscribe and be notified every time I release a new video. Why do we have three hosts in this episode? So David Tullman, the co-founder of Instapath, was a guest of mine on one of my podcast episodes. And when we were recording this, he said, oh, I am the host of the new Beyond the Scope podcast. This is the DPA, Digital Pathology Association podcast. And I'm going to invite you to an episode as well. And then time passed. Nobody ever invited me till this week or two weeks ago. Anyway, recently, David sent me an email and they invited me to a crossover podcast episode. So it's going to be David. It's going to be Giovanni Lujan, who is the co-host of Beyond the Scope and me. All right, so here we are. This is the first time that we're doing this. This is this is a, a crossover podcast of some sorts. We have Alex and Giovanni here. So we have hello, 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 hello. And um, <laughs> the purpose of this is we wanted to get the we wanted to get some of the podcasters together just to to talk about the the hot topics in digital pathology. Talk about some of the news items we've been following. We're always like interviewing guests, so we never give a chance to give our own opinions on what's going on. So this is a fun opportunity to do that. And um, so since we probably have all sorts of different audiences here, this is going to be uh, published on a couple different podcast feeds. Alex and Giovanni, yeah. you two, you two are meeting for the first time. So We're why don't you guys meeting for the first time, <laughs> indeed? So yeah, so for, yeah, we are all guests and all hosts today. Um, right. <laughs> Because this is uh, Beyond the Scope and Digital Pathology Podcast. So, Giovanni, exactly. welcome to my podcast and uh, feel free to welcome me to your podcast, guys. <laughs> Very happy to have you. <laughs> I'm a right? fan. I... Yeah, I'm a fan of yours, guys. I have been looking at the, your podcast and listening to your podcast, and I stole some of your guests. So, for example, I love the podcast with David Clooney, and mm. I totally, after listening to your uh, podcast, I was like, oh, he has to come to mine as well. I, I think, I think, I think, if we're not stealing guests, then we're not doing it right. Because our goal, right? our goal for both of our podcasts is to get the best guests, and naturally, we have to share, right? Exactly, and. Also, this is not such a huge niche, I would say. Probably everybody heard about everybody, and uh, it's good to cover topics from different angles. So, yeah, I'm honored to be here, guys. And nice to meet you, Giovanni, because uh, David, I already know, because he was already guest on my podcast mm -hmm. before. Yeah, he, he told me about that. And I think we kind of started at the same time, sort of, because I remember I started following you, I think, in LinkedIn, and we were just because I like what you were, were posting there. And then I noticed that you were also coming up with a podcast. And so there were several similarities. And yeah. And as you said, we kind of get it from, from different angles, different perspectives. And perhaps we share guests, but we all have different perspectives, different point of views that we elicit on the guests. So I think it's good that the guests go the rounds, go around uh, sharing their 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 opinions with us because they always have something different, something new to say. Mm -hmm. So I remember also Hensa Gif was your guest once. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she was my guest as well. So I'm going to be linking to all those double podcasts in the description uh, and in the show notes. Um, but one question, my question to you guys, before we sure. dive into hot yeah. topics and everything, yeah. what is your mission with your podcast? And like, what's your main angle? And then I'm going to tell you mine. Perfect. Well, it was sort of uh, an idea of one of the committees of the Digital Pathology Association to kind of put some faces and voices out there to try to broadcast the news, to put some of the projects we're working on out there, get people to know about 
what the DPA does, and that evolves into also presenting people who have something to to do in the in the digital pathology world, involving everybody, not only academic but also the industry research and all these different characters or professions that have come together to be this wide world of digital pathology, which is not a physician world, is not an engineer's world, is not a business world, it's kind of a combined world where we all came with different backgrounds trying to promote this. So I think that's sort of the, 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 the main goal of us, try to get everybody together, learn from each other and let people to know about the Digital mm-hmm. Pathology Association. Anything I missed, David? The only, the only thing that I would add is I kind of came in a little bit late in the process. This, this, is, not, this is not my original idea. But the, the first time that I was on this that I was on this committee meeting, I remember Giovanni like super excited talking about how he, he was really into doing it. He just didn't um, there just wasn't like a, a plan to actually do it. So I had done I had you had a podcast before, yeah, right? Yeah, I will so I still like do it. It's like it's candidate to... just just for fun, just for fun. I I I have and I still do this like college football podcast with my friends. It's more of an excuse just to get together every week and talk because we're all in different places. But I actually know, I actually kind of knew what I was doing in terms of producing the podcast. So I happily- I see your headphones and I see your microphone, uh-huh. Pro, and I like, I, okay, full disclosure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in Poland now. My internet yeah. is so bad and uh, I am recording on my phone today. So totally like a zero professionalism of a podcaster. Whereas David, if you're looking on video, you're going to see his mic and everything. Uh, and if you're listening to audio, I hope my audio is not that bad today. Uh, sounds really good right now. Okay. It looks okay. very good we have, too. You have great We can do stuff. some post-processing. Okay, guys, now I think, full disclosure I th- with the light. This is my light. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we figured it out. And th- I think th- I think the last thing I wanted to say about our podcast is um, just to echo um, Giovanni's um, thought on how just digital pathology is such a collaborative community. I'm I'm just really happy that we ended up doing the co-host thing. We have the voice of a, the voice of a pathologist that's actually signing out cases with digital pathology represented. And then we have a voice of someone like me who's innovating in the space, knows a little bit about the business, engineer by and, has an, and, and knows engineering. So I'm, I'm really happy that we have the two different perspectives. Yeah. So guys, now the three of us cover even more because I'm a veterinary exactly. pathologist exactly. working in the pharmaceutical and industry in a CRO supporting pharma. So totally like all the angles. Well, we do not have a computer scientist, do we? No, no, not not as a host, but we get we get computer <laughs> exactly. scientists for like yeah, thirty guess, for I like a third that. of our guests. So by exactly. nature, so it works out that way. No, so we cover quite some spectrum of this collaborative discipline that we are engaged in, digital pathology. And I totally second you guys. It is a multidisciplinary area, and the the goal of my podcast is. What I have seen that there was a big gap between pathologists and computer scientists. And then basically, because we have like um, so many different stakeholders, uh, I was in a situation where it was pathologists and computer scientists, but you have pathologists, engineers, you have uh, pathologists, regulatory, and like all of them together, and you need to build those bridges. So I think podcasts are a fantastic way to build those bridges for an area that needs bridges to function well. My mission, and I guess we have a, a bit of a similar mission yeah. from a different yeah. angle. Let's ask, I'm gonna, I wanna ask Giovanni because you, you, a lot of your projects are rooted in computer science, right? So you're working with a lot of computer scientists, right? And yes, definitely. And uh, that's our second, like what does- How's they- that going, Giovanni? <laughs> Interesting and because I have right? not much of a computer background or an engineer background. And uh, to Ohio, Columbus, mm-hmm. where I am right now, from Dallas, Texas. So I came here with the purpose of helping 
with the implementation of the digital pathology workflow. And at the beginning, it was just our daily routine work, just moving from glass to, to, to digital. So that was, that was the first part of the transition. Now we became fully digital in January this year, where all our slides get digitized after production. And now we are on the verge of deploying our first sets of algorithms in, in, in our daily use. And in that part is where I started interacting with all these different engineers, computer technicians. Different engineers. And no, a complete different lingo, a complete different set <laughs> yep. of expectations. <laughs> and uh, then is when you realize that in order for a, a meeting to be complete and to get somewhere, you have to start including all these different representations because if there are only pathologies, we'll do nothing. We just can't wish, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> we need a, an IT person who tells us what's, the, what's doable and what's not based on what we have or what we need to acquire. And then we're working with the eyes, so we need somebody who knows programming, who understands what that's about and who can judge and qualify an algorithm because there are so many vendors right now and they can come and tell us everything and the only thing that we do is open our mouth, right? Oh. But <laughs> we need somebody to ask the substance are questions that how do you assess an algorithm? And I've been learning an immense deal of things, and I'm hoping that my colleagues, the engineers and the computer scientists, are also learning from me pathology. So everybody of us has a different component. And again, if we are all not in the room or in the phone call, the meeting goes nowhere because that <laughs> part is missing. I hear a shout out to all those engineers, all those computer scientists and all those vendors. You go and drop comments below this uh, this podcast, wherever you're listening to it. We need you. And it was just a joke. We love you and we need you. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Absolutely. They are they're in the in the same ball game too because everything is new. They're trying to come up with solutions every day from hardware, software, algorithms, what have you. Everything is new, it needs to be tested, it needs to be proven, not only that it works empirically, but also that it delivers in, in when it's implemented clinically. And uh, so if, not, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't go anywhere either, because that's basically that was become become sort of topic of conversation. Another thing is that, and this is what vendors are learning, I think, from the experiences is that they cannot do everything. Digital pathology, computational pathology, I think initially was thought to be, oh, this company is going to go into that and it's going to do everything, hardware, software, the whatever the steps. Didn't happen, so did it? I can really speak to that because when we started, <laughs> when, when, when my company spun off, from Tulane in 2017, we really genuinely thought we were building like a like a platform microscope that was going to be able to do literally everything in pathology. And as we got out there and we did our pilots and we did our beta testing, we were we were so wrong. We just we learned that we had to we really had to in order to at least get some initial traction, we we had to significantly narrow our focus, kind of pick one lane to go down into pick, you know, a, a very narrow uh, number of use cases and applications and, and truly validate those. And the whole one company or one product to, to rule them all was just never going to be possible. Died. This idea died quickly. I think it's similar to the AI, like the concept of AI. Everybody's thinking, oh, it's going to do everything. No, it's doing one thing at a time. And you can have like hundreds of them that do one thing at a time, but they still do one thing at a time and they still have to do this one thing good, well, to be accepted in the community. Well, I think that's the perfect transition because we wanted to talk about some of the hot topics and some of the, the yeah, news, David, the news items a, that we've been following. A yeah. Agenda. I do. We might, we have, but you have a very like ambitious one and we <laughs> might need to divide the, into two episodes but that's fine maybe, let's maybe. go for it no i think the first i mean the, the 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 relevant one is in the last year uh we've seen cap 
produce guidelines about how institutions should be doing internal validation studies. Um, if they are planning on go going digital, what should they be doing with the whole slide scanners that they've just purchased to validate? I think like the highlights are 60 cases seems to do it, looking for like a 95% concordance rate, and then some kind of washout period to, to re-review those images afterwards. And um, now a guideline that's published, I guess, Giovanni, have, is that something that you guys followed at Ohio State? And I think we did a podcast on this, but maybe you guys came up with some some analogous guidelines as well that you followed when you did your validation, right? We, we've been using everything that the CAP is putting out. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be part of the Digital and Computational Pathology Committee. And this committee is not supposed to put out guidelines, but we are recommending the guidelines for the committee who put out the guidelines. And I am playing an important role there because not too many people are actually doing the, the digital workflow in this committee. So I'm one of the ones who bring that kind of experience. And, and that's actually my, my, because we are very fortunate in this committee to have people with expertise in all the different areas of computational pathology, which I'm, I'm lacking in terms of training because Again, I don't have a computer background or a scientist background to understand all the nuances of the digitization process of AI participation, but we do have all this in, the, in this committee. And my claim to fame in the committee is that I'm actually doing the, the labor <laughs> so they can, I can kind of provide that feedback of what's working and not. So we are using the CAP guidelines and providing also feedback for what uh, is not in the guidelines yet. For instance, for validation of for our systems at home, we started doing remote digital pathology and there were no guidelines for that. So mm -hmm. we developed our own internal validation and guidelines for that. We're giving that to the CAP and they are collecting information from other centers to and eventually, with these recommendations, a set of recommendations will be put out to for people who want to validate the pathology from home as well. Oh, everything from is home. in the works. That's... Everything is in the works. And no much is out yet, just kind of the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of things will be starting coming out slowly from, from, from the CAP. I was just going to say that from on the vendor side, I mean, that's certainly what we've started looking to anytime we set up a pilot with an institution, we just go to the guidelines and say, look, CAP is recommending 60 patients. This is the this is the concordance metric that we're hoping to hit. And we're going to do the washout period. And we find that that seems to be provide enough evidence for um, institutions to make a decision if they, they really want to do this workflow or not. Interested yeah. in collaborating with us? With us, I mean, with the CAP and the Digital Pathology Association because they see this as just the beginning of a wave of algorithms and techniques and new tools that they will have to validate. So they're trying to set up initial guidelines and processes set up these processes that people, vendors can follow to have their, their tools validated in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, so guys, we have guidelines as well. We meaning there has been an FDA uh, guideline document um, published. It, I think the comments have been submitted like, I don't know, last month for use of digital pathology in non-clinical uh, non -clinical work, uh, GLP compliant, mm -hmm. so good laboratory practice compliant, yeah. which in theory, and in those guidelines, you basically, when you do digital pathology, you read those guidelines and it's like common sense. So uh, like there is, so we have a process called peer review. So when I would evaluate a study for um, a pharmaceutical company, the pathologist from the pharmaceutical company is checking uh, like some percentage of what I did and if, uh, if we agree. So for this peer review, uh, this was already in the works. And now me as the one who is evaluating those studies as the primary pathologist can do it uh, digitally. It was already possible to do like 
all the time because the GOP guidelines have a uh, GOP uh, compliance um, defines how to validate computerized systems and mm. digital pathology system is a computerized system but nobody mm. has done it so far and like nobody was officially talking about digital pathology as like a special type of computerized system so now we have guidelines uh, pharma industry and CRO submitted comments and uh, there was a first instance of validation for primary read uh, at my day job at Charles River Laboratories. So I actually started reading studies digitally. But we also have official guidelines. And I have to do a podcast episode about that because um, I think people, I don't know, think the guidelines are more complicated than they are. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you, have, my... that, do you have that uh, impression, uh, David? Because you said you were reaching out to vendors and they're like, not really knowing what to do and you show the guidelines and it's kind of clear yeah i, I think the, i think that the guidelines at least for the the clinical validation make it clear and they make sense um i guess and i i, I felt like it was you, you said the word common sense i felt like it was just common sense what people were kind of doing before it was officially published and i, I was going to ask you like now that your guidelines are published was there were there any surprises or is it just kind of writing down what you were, you guys were like publishing officially what you guys were doing anyways most of the things is just writing it down there is a lot about archiving that um, there was a little bit of um, discussion uh, whether like everything always has to be archived um, because for the peer review, uh, so the second pathologist reviewing my work, you don't really archive that, you just say it was done. But now when it's done on digital slides, um, the guidelines say, oh, you should archive that. So there was a little bit of pushback, We're like, okay, when we are, why should we do that? Uh, it's just like input, the, the second pathologist, they're not the primary person evaluating the study, it's the study pathologist, so the main pathologist, and every, uh, like all the data comes from the main pathologist. So why should we archive uh, that other part? Uh, we'll see, With the many institutions submitted the comments, so we'll see if we're gonna get uh, a waiver on that or not. Uh, when we are actually doing the primary read digitally, it doesn't really matter because you have those slides and you, you have them digitally anyway. And then you send the digital slides to your peer reviewer. But sometimes the first pathologist is reading on glass and then we only scan and give it to the peer reviewer. And that was also kind of COVID, not invention, mm -hmm. but COVID implementation because usually for peer review, um, people traveled. So I would read a study in my day job and somebody from a pharma company would come to my place and meet with me, look at the slides on glass and talk to me about, okay, do we agree here? Do we disagree? And now, of course, they couldn't come. So we started scanning. And uh, so there's a little bit of discussion. Oh, shall we archive everything because it's so much data, huge data and all that jazz, as we know very well from <laughs> digital pathology. But other than that, mostly common sense what people were already doing and what was GLP compliant anyway. Do you, when, because pharma has been using digital longer than we've been using it clinically, how is the adoption of digital in pharma? I still, a lot of laboratories or pharma companies using glass or how is the transition going there? It depends like what part of the drug uh, discovery and drug development pipeline. There was a lot of image analysis uh, being done across the board. So for this, like you do digital pathology period. And there is a lot of discovery. So discovery is, what I'm doing is safety, toxicological safety, tox safety, we call it, which is when you already like discovered your compound, you checked on animal models and like this discovery part is already done and you're checking, okay, is it gonna be safe? And you check first the safety in animals and then if it passes a serious like a uh, row of different studies, then you can take it to a clinical trial. So in this tox safety area, the adoption is not that great, I have to say. So the, the pre-safety discovery, this is non-GLP. 
everything that's non-GLP, you can basically not bother about validating your systems according to the GLP guidelines. People do it anyway, because usually you have a mixture of, uh, of work. But for what I'm doing, the adoption is slow. I think the, 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 the fact that we validated it and that we started doing it, and we work with so many pharma companies, my CRO, that we're kind of a hub that then like spreads it to other pharma companies. I hope I, <laughs> maybe it's just wishful thinking, but uh, basically there it, it's patchy. It's patchy. It's like a puzzle. Some parts are like, you know, strong and built together, but there's the, it's not fully digitized yet. It doesn't surprise me because that's exactly what we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's slow? Is the pathologist himself, you think the main, the main, the limiting factor for adoption or the cost? I don't think it's the cost because pharma companies usually, that's not a fact. <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks that, but then um, I think that look too. <laughs> Actually, I don't think in general, when I learned from David Clooney, how much an MRI costs and that this is like millions of dollars, it then like a scanner is a cheap piece of equipment. So yeah. I think the, the problem is the interoperability and uh, of systems and how many teams it takes to make this thing happen. Like, you know, let's say you have a company, um, I don't know, Giovanni, in your uh, place now, everybody likes digital pathology, like all the pathologists, right? You're fully digital. Uh, we, do, we still have some naysayers. I mean, they You get, do? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody it, has. I mean, everybody has. So... Um, everybody you uses know. it to some degree, but still mm -hmm. some say that they, even though they get all the images first... They still get the glass uh, for mm -hmm. one reason or another. Yeah, I think if it was just, you know, dependent on one group uh, of professionals, be it pathologists or I don't know, uh, IT, whatever, it would be easier to implement because across institutional work is difficult, like because it's difficult, because it's cross-institutional and you have to talk to people with different uh, priorities in their groups, uh, then like bringing everybody on the same page and bringing the corporate leadership on the same page to do this is just challenging. Like with anything else, I don't think it's digital technology specific. I think it's new technology specific as well. Well, new technology new characteristic, yeah, yes, well, characteristic for new technology people are very resistant to to change we always compare it with emerging technologies uh and how they are you know take this period you have early adopters then this low adoption and finally people years later still don't have an iphone or, or a smartphone they still use some sort of clamshell you know because they doesn't have just one person I know that doesn't do this. <laughs> Everybody knows somebody at least. That's what I, that's what I <laughs> kind, of, kind of side note. That's like what I aspire. I, I hope I can get to the point in my career where I don't need a smartphone, where I can like I've done it. I've done enough and everything that I direct goes so well that I can be off the grid a little bit because you're you get you get married to it sometimes and it's such a can be a distraction. But that's not yeah. there yet. Not there yet. Not even close. <laughs> yeah, but what what do you think, David? Why is it difficult? I'm going to disagree a little bit because I think I, I I do think cost. Go ahead and disagree. I think cost. I think cost is playing a big role in it. You mentioned earlier that you know relative to MRI scanners that a slide scanner is cheap, and cheap relatively is is, is certainly true. But it, it seems to me like pathology departments are the departments that are purchasing this system. And the pathology budget, my understanding is that the pathology budget at a lot of institutions is just not even close to what the radiology budget is or what the surgery budget is. So while these systems may be cheap relative to the, you know, the expensive MRI systems or CT scanners, you know, those really big things that are used in surgery and radiology. So, bigger, so much bigger budgets. 
And yeah, yeah, surgeons and radiologists, go ahead and comment. Why do sure. you guys have more money than pathologists? I, that's a fair question. And I, I'm wondering if uh, if we see digital pathology adoption increase, that's going to increase the budget for pathology departments, and that's going to help close this adoption gap. But we're, I, I see that if we're talking about the adoption curve, or we're talking about the bell curve, if we're looking at my whiteboard, we are on the very left side of the bell curve in the earliest of adopters phase right now. Good, then that's good for us because we're early and then there's going to be a boom, right? Soon, hopefully. That's what, that's what the that's what the bell curve tells us is that there should be a boom coming. But um, I think yeah. I think the biz I think institutions need to work on the business case a little bit in order for this to become more mainstream in the U.S. David, so you guys were doing the uh, fluorescent way of imaging, right? Without mm -hmm. um, making slides. Mm -hmm. So that's like the roadblock that everybody says, okay, it's different from radiology because they just went straight to digital media and we still have mm -hmm. the analog media. How's that going uh, at your company? It's challenging. Um, I think like I mentioned earlier, we, we've, we've really had to narrow our focus and kind of pick a lane. And we decided to just take a baby step and and make our first clinical application um, just um, a tissue adequacy evaluation. So you can use our system for like a mm -hmm. like a touch prep or a, or a frozen section type evaluation. And that's just we felt like that was the best starting point. It's kind of a low hanging fruit from a validation standpoint, um, and it's also not a primary diagnosis. So um, that's just like the baby step that we feel we felt was needed to um, get pathologists more comfortable with the the workflow and the the image type that you know we're, we we produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pathologists comfortable with the workflow yeah. is an our challenge in itself. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think what you guys doing and um, a couple of other companies start doing this to like think how to eliminate the glass and. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic idea, and I also think this is gonna face such a huge resistance. Yeah. It, 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 from my experience, it, it definitely up. I, I face a huge resistance, but it's okay. Nothing, nothing great ever happens uh, without resistance. Without overcoming and, this resistance. And I, I, but I also, I, I accept the resistance, and I, I understand. I do understand the resistance, and that understanding just helps me figure out something that is going to work, I think we're quite a ways off from being able to have blast-free pathology. Mm -hmm. I know that we don't have endless time here. We have to wrap up a little bit. And I had this grand idea for all these hot topics. We covered we covered a couple of them really well. So I think we're going to have- we have to meet again. That's yeah, okay. I think we're going to have to do this. I think we are going to have to make this kind of like more of a regular thing. I was thinking, you know, we do this once a quarter or a couple times a year, we kind of get together. Totally. Well, well, we need I mean, to. We do... want to do this. If every, everybody yes. who's listening to this, comment below. Do you want us to meet, or was it like pointless yeah. rambling? Let us know. <laughs> yeah, suggestions for topics we should cover. Um, I, 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 I vote. I vote yes. Let's do it again. Yeah. You vote yes. So I we have yes to do. Too. We have to we have to come up with some kind of like catchy name for like what is what is this group called like we're we're some like pathology let's do a competition the, the, some... let's do a competition on LinkedIn like let's... for our regular meetings yeah um I think that would be great and I think let's let's just wrap let's just go ahead and wrap this up then Alex do you want to plug what's kind of what, what are the next big things for your podcast and your website yeah and Giovanni, guys, I, will speak I have to a ours. big thing coming. Cool. Yeah, I do have, I prepared for this question of yours, David. Okay, good. I do have a big thing coming. Hopefully already September, maybe I'm going to start uh, in October. So I reached out to several uh, computer scientists active in the in our digital pathology space, and I want to invite them for webinars. So uh, they mostly work in the open source software space, at least my first three guests and uh, anybody who follows that can guess who they can be but you will know soon and um, so i want to have a regular webinar series with um scientists active in this space and uh, help them promote and learn from them because 
those people are, they have a huge knowledge that I want to share with the community and they're not vendors. So they're, you know, not marketing themselves. They publish papers. Who reads those papers? Maybe we read them if we have spare time, which we don't have, uh, but sometimes we read them. But the rest of the community and, uh, you know, non-pathologists and people who are um, involved in the digital pathology effort, but uh, do not like have this as their as their interests or whatever, have other stuff to do. I want to deliver this as a webinar that's going to be also on my website and parts of it are going to be on YouTube as well. So that's my new thing. How about awesome. you guys? Awesome. We're going to put great. Right? Yeah, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to see that. We'll, we'll post those links for us. Um, our next big thing is we're going to be Giovanni and I are going to be on site at the Digital Pathology Association Visions Conference. And in October in Las Vegas, we are going to have a podcast booth set up. We're going to be doing on-person interviews, kind of like Radio Row at the Super Bowl. And um, so cool, it'll, it'll be, okay. we've, done, we've done all these remotely. And now we're actually going to be pulling some people in at the conference. And those episodes should drop end of October and through November. Oh my goodness. Fantastic. This is yeah. so cool, guys. I I did not plan to go, but sometimes plans change. And that would be so cool. The last time I was a school oh, was 2019. If, if you're there, yeah. listen, if you're there, we'll, we'll add you to the table. Uh-huh. Yeah. Just oh, my goodness. That's the idea. I need it's to just... figure out how to go. <laughs> Uh, you can find how to register <laughs> at the link that we're going to post on the episode. All right. Okay. Uh, this is really fun. We're going to do this again. We'll come up with a great name for this until then. And I'm going to have my full setup then. I'm, I'm not going to be doing this on the phone. Awesome. All right. Can't wait to do it again. Thanks. This is really fun. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, It was a different episode because it was more hot topics and uh, what's going on in the digital pathology world. You stayed so long. I am beyond grateful. So I have a surprise for you. I'm going to tell you what this is. This is my dad's old trichinoscope, Polish production. Let's see if we can show. Anyway, it says Polish production made in Poland in, uh, I looked at the leaflet, it was 1970. So uh, he used to, he used to be a hunter. He passed away. He used to be a hunter. And uh, back then you would examine the meat uh, yourself. So boar meat that can carry trichinella spiralis. Can be, boars can be um, infected with trichinosis. So he had to check this before we ate the meat that he hunted. And I'm from Poland and uh, when I was little, it was the late 80s, there was not too much meat on the shelves in Poland. So he used this device to uh, check that the meat we're eating was good. So let me know in the comments if you saw the trichinoscope. Let's see how many people stayed till the end of the episode.